For you see, there are times in our lives when, when we need somebody to lift our heads. We need somebody to uh, help us to keep going and to, to keep moving on in life. Uh, let me ask you this question tonight, and that is simply this. Do you know of a person or a group of people who you don't want to see? You hope you don't have to see them each day. Because of things they've done or, or things they've said or, or the way they've acted towards you. You just wake up in the morning and you get up and, and you, you look in the mirror and you say, God, there's one prayer I, I pray today. Don't let me see so and so. Or don't let me see this group of people because if you do, my day is already shot. I can't worship you today if I see that person because of what they do inside of me. They just they control my feelings. They control how I spend my day. And I can see them and already my day is gone. Anybody ever experienced that before in life? Yeah, absolutely. We all do. That's one of the giants we experience in life. That is the giant of allowing other people to control our feelings. And how we view our day and how we allow our day to go. Maybe it's someone at work. And you know this person at work has been that person that, that has always gotten the benefits. Has always gotten the good things happen to them. A new office opens up and they get it even though you've been there twice as long as them. Or there's one cup left at the cooler and they get it. And they turn around and you and say, good morning, but all you hear is na 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 That's all you hear. Because that person just hurts you. Or maybe you're at school and, and you think, oh my goodness, I don't want to see that person. And what's the first person you see? That person walking across the campus. Or that person getting off the bus and you're like, oh, I was hoping they were sick today. But they weren't. And they're there. And all of a sudden that feeling, that anxiety, that stress comes in you because that person is controlling how you feel. And that person is controlling the day that God has given to you. We know we all face that. We all experience that. And if you remember last week, we began looking at this man named David. Uh, I'm really amazed at the parallels that God has given us with Sunday morning. And Sunday night is really cool because I get to talk about Samuel in the morning and David at night. And it's, it's, it's it's just cool to the preacher. Um, so we talked about how David was, you remember the, the littlest that I talked about last week? David was the littlest in his family. He was the baby in the family. And he was even facing a giant of exclusion in his life because when Samuel was sent to Jesse in Bethlehem to find the next king and anoint the next king, uh, Samuel went to Jesse and he said, I need to see your sons. And he brought these seven sons and every one of them looked like a king to Samuel. But God said, no, that's not the one. That's not the one. And then uh, at the end, Samuel looked at Jesse and said, is this all the sons you got? And he said, well, we got the baby or the littlest one. And he's out in the field, you know, taking care of the sheep. And Samuel said, I need to see him. And so he brings him up and, and the Lord tells Samuel, that's the one. I need you to anoint him because he's the next king. And, and so, even in, in the smallest, God had something planned for him. Well, tonight we get looking at another of David's giants. And as we look at this, I want to take us back to the scene of David's battle. If you remember, the Israelites were on one hill. The Philistines were on the other hill. And a valley in between them. And so they were on each side. And, and if you remember the story that we talked about a few weeks back... David went up there to take his brother some food and, and the giant came out and was trash talking the Israelites as he did every day, every morning, every evening. The giant came out and David uh, looked at kind of his brothers and the Israelites and he said, what's going on? You know, why, why are we not really doing anything about this giant? And they said, because we're scared of him, we're intimidated. And every time the giant would talk and come out, they would turn and run and, and hide, except for David. David said, I can't take this. You know, I can't allow this giant, this Philistine, to trash talk our God and, and us as people, as the people of God. So we've got to do something. And so David goes up against Goliath, and he kills Goliath. And not only does he kill Goliath, 
But he also uh, cuts off Goliath's head. And he lifts up Goliath's head, sort of as a trophy. Now the Philistines see that their great giant Goliath has been killed. And what the what Philistines do is they automatically turn and run. Because without a giant, what good are we? And so they, they turn and they run. Well, the Israelites look at the Philistines and they're like, whoa, they're human. We can get them. And so the Israelites start chasing the Philistines and they chase them out of their camp. And after they've chased them out of their camp, they come back to their camp and they plunder their camp. They take everything. They, they tear up everything. They destroy everything. And they get this victory over their camp and over the Philistines. And David has the head of the Goliath and he's carrying it. Now get this picture. He's carrying the head of Goliath, this big Goliath, back to Jerusalem. Okay, so he's kind of got it in his hand. I don't know how he's holding it. Maybe by the hair of the head. Maybe by the big helmet. Maybe somehow. I don't know how he's doing it. But he's carrying the head of Goliath. Not only does he carry the head, but he's also carrying the weapons of Goliath. Now remember how big the weapons were. Here's little David. David has got all these trophies. <laughs> you know, it's like wood fishing and you catch all these fish and, and you bring them back home. Well, Goliath has a head and he has these weapons that he's taken back. Well, Saul, Saul sees this scene of David when David was going to fight Goliath. And Saul looks at him and, and he, he goes to Abner. Now, Abner, another great Bible name, Abner was a commander for the army, for the Israelites. And Saul goes to Abner and says, who is that kid? Who, who's his dad? And Abner says, beats me. I don't know. And so uh, Saul says, what I need you to do is find out whose son that is for me. And Abner says, we'll do. And so Abner goes to David. He says, now, whose son are you? And he says, I am the son of your servant, Jesse. I am the son of your servant, Jesse. And then when David kills Goliath, Saul keeps David with him. And in the midst of Saul keeping David with him, there's this incredible bond. There's this incredible relationship that builds between Saul's son, Jonathan, and David. So David is with Saul. He's working for Saul. Saul gets upset some, from time to time. David begins playing music for him. It soothes Saul. And so Saul keeps him around. And in the midst of that, this incredible relationship begins. So look at what it says here in 1 Samuel 18, 3 and 4. And Jonathan made a covenant or a promise with David because he loved him as himself. Jonathan took off the robe he was wearing and gave it to David. Now, when we look at this robe, what we've got to remember is this was a purple robe because with Saul being the king, Jonathan would have been the next in line to take the throne. But look what he does. He takes off the robe that would have been the prince robe or the robe he was wearing signifying his position. He gives it to David along with his tunic and even his sword, his bow, and his belt. Look at what Jonathan's doing here. Jonathan is basically saying, David, I'm giving my right to be king to you. I'm handing it over to you. I'm giving it to you, and I am I just appreciate you and love you so much. I'm making this covenant with you that I will always be your friend. I will always be there for you. I will always take care of you. Now that's important as we're going to see in just a few minutes. This covenant, this relationship that Jonathan makes with David. Well, so the scene turns and, and Jonathan comes back from battle. He comes back into Jerusalem. Got Goliath's head, got weapons, all that stuff. And he comes in and there's this big celebration that begins to take place. The scripture tells us that all these women begin singing this song of celebration. And it simply says this. Uh, David, I mean Saul killed his thousands. David killed his Ten thousands. And then the mood changes. Just like a good, suspenseful LMN movie. Now, do you know what an LMN movie is? Lifetime Movie Network. Lifetime Movie Network. And what they, they show a lot of suspenseful movies and a lot of 
a lot of these movies that keep you on the edge of your seat. And if we were watching LMN, if this movie or this scene was on LMN, what would have happened was when the lady saying David or Saul has killed his thousands, David has killed his ten thousands, the camera would have immediately got close to Saul. He would have looked in the camera and you'd have heard this weird music. Because the scene has changed. The attitude has changed. All of a sudden, Saul, who is so excited about having David around him, is so excited about being with him, something happens in his heart. He hears the these, these singing, and he basically says this, Wait a second. Did I just hear what I thought I heard? Did I just hear that these ladies saying that I killed thousands, but yet David killed ten thousands? That can't happen. That cannot happen. I cannot allow this to happen because what Saul began to think was this. If David is getting that kind of reception, what's next for him? Taking my spot as king. And I can't allow that to happen. And so at that minute, when David hears, or when that singing takes place, Nothing David did, now remind, remind you, nothing David did caused Saul to be angry at him. But it was what Saul had happened inside of his heart that allowed him to get angry and jealous and bitter at David just because David did what he was supposed to do in serving God. Well, Jonathan, remember the friendship with Jonathan and David? Saul, after he sees what's happening, begins to try to kill David. I mean, as a matter of fact, they're in the palace there, and all of a sudden David's playing his music, and all of a sudden this spear comes flying at him. And Saul misses him, but Paul, Saul says, I want to pin him against the wall, and I want to kill him. Well, David didn't get the hint. Saul tries another way. Saul says, what I'm going to do is I want you to marry my daughter. That sounds a great thing. But he put this kind of a, uh, you've got to do something in order to marry my daughter. And what he thought is if he goes and does this to these people, they're going to get mad. They'll kill him. Well, he goes and does it. They don't kill him. He comes back and says, look, I've done it. And now he marries Saul's daughter. And Saul says, it didn't happen. Several other times, Saul throws spears at David, trying to kill him, trying to get rid of him, and it doesn't happen. And so Jonathan goes to Saul and tells him, he says, Saul, he said, Dad, what are you doing? What are you doing trying to kill David? He's done nothing to you. Why are you hurting him? You can't hurt him. And Saul says, I've got to get rid of him. So Jonathan, after talking to Saul about the situation, Saul says, I tell you what, I won't do anything to him. I won't hurt him. And I assure you, no harm will come to David. So David goes back to Saul and begins playing his music for him again. When Saul gets angry and throws another spear at David. And again misses, but this time David is like, okay, throw six of them at me, there's got to be problems somewhere. And so David says, I'm out of here. So David leaves, he escapes, he gets out of the way, and, you know, he didn't deserve any of that treatment. He didn't do anything to get in trouble. But he was afraid for his life, which he should have been, because Saul was trying to kill him. Now, let me show you something. A lot of times people say, or ask, why do people get so angry? Why do people get so angry? Let me tell you the root of 90% of anger. Here it is. Saul became still more, and there's that word, afraid of him being David. And he remained his enemy the rest of his days. Most of the time, folks, when people are angry, they're afraid. There's some kind of fear that is underneath that's causing this anger. If, if parents get angry at their children, let's say a, a child runs in the road and, and the parent just gets really upset and irate and starts screaming, they're not mad at the child. They're afraid of what was going to happen. 
And there's that fear. When people hear bad news of their health, they get very angry. They're not mad at the disease. They're scared of what's going to happen. Most of the time, when people become angry, it's because of the fear they have. So if anybody gets angry at you, and I had this happen to me when I was in a residency and chaplaincy, my supervisor with our group of chaplains, we were sitting there, and one of the chaplains got really, really angry. And the supervisor looked at him and said, what are you afraid of? What are you afraid of? And the chaplain looked at him and said, I'm afraid that you're going to change this whole situation. And I will not be able to complete this thing. And he assured him that wasn't going to happen. And it calmed the anger. Most of the time when people are angry, they're afraid of something that's going to take place. Saul was no different. Saul was angry, not at David particularly. He was angry and afraid that he was going to be taken away as being the king. Which did happen, not because of David, but because of his disobedience to God. So what do we do with this? What do we do with this? You see, we pray about this, and we pray for God to, to take care of people that, that bother us, that get us upset, or that anger, or angry at us. You know, we may see the people that get on our nerves each day, and we may say, you know, God, I don't want them to die, but if you get them a little sick, that might be good. God, I don't want them to get hurt, but if, if they're in a car wreck and laid up a few days, that's not a bad thing. That would help me. And we start going in all these weird directions about people that are getting on our nerves when, when what we're basically doing is we're allowing them to control our feelings and our lives and our days and everything else. So how do we handle it? Well, David had a friend. David had a friend in Jonathan. And Jonathan told David, said, David, I will do anything for you. I will take care of you. I will help you in any way. I don't want you to be hurt, so leave, get away, do something. I don't want you to get hurt. And what David found in Jonathan was somebody that would always be with him. Well, let me tell you tonight. In the midst of people who become angry at us, in the midst of people who get on our nerves, in the midst of people who annoy us, one thing we can rest assured in is this. We have a friend. In Jesus Christ, who is just like Jonathan, even better. Jesus Christ has promised never to leave us or forsake us and to always be there for us. And to always help us. As the song said, the choir son, He is our glory. He is our shield. He is the lifter of our head. He is the one that can help us when those times get difficult. So, what do we do? How do we handle it each day? We, you know, we have a choice each day when we wake up. We have a choice that we can do. We can either focus and allow that person or that group of people to just ruin our day. Or we can focus on the fact that we have a friend so great that he will take care of us no matter what happens. No matter what that bully at school does, that bully at school will never be as good as God. Never be as powerful as God. Will never take care of us like God does. So, you know, we can look at that bully at school and we can say, you know what? I may not like you. Matter of fact, I really don't like you. But you're not going to ruin my day. You're not going to take my joy. Because my joy comes in knowing that I have a friend in Jesus Christ. Just like David had a friend in Jonathan. We can go to work and we can see that person and, and all of a sudden that anxiety comes in our hearts and, and we can feel it building up inside of us. But I challenge us when we go to work and we see that person to look and pray and say, God, that person, I know they get on my nerves, I know they bother me, but you know what? They don't take away my joy. Because my joy and my privilege in this day is in serving you. My privilege in this day is in the fact that you created this day for me to have a relationship with you. And that person can't stop that. They can come up to you and they can pick and they can poke and they can talk trash to you just like Goliath did. They can do a lot of things to try to hurt you and try to ruin your day. But if we focus on Jesus Christ, we can take our focus off of that which annoys us. 
and that which scares us and that which bothers us. You see, if we're not in fear, more than likely we won't get angry and our day won't be ruined. But if we allow the fear, just like David did, without Jonathan, he would have constantly been in fear. But with Jonathan, Jonathan said, listen, I'm going to be with you. I'm going to protect you. I'm going to help you. And later on in the story, he does it more and more until David realizes, he is my friend. And I think one of the things we need to realize as Christians today is that we have a friend that's greater than any person that annoys us. We have a friend that's more wonderful than anybody who bothers us. And no matter what happens, we can focus on worshiping God because God will always be with us. And He will always take care of us. And He will never leave us. I hope you get what we're saying tonight. When it comes to facing the giants of the souls in our lives, we have a choice to either allow them to make our lives miserable or to allow God to make our lives joyful. We have a choice to make each and every day when we wake up. And I hope our choice will be like David did in the book of Psalm when he sang this song. It said, The Lord lives. Praise be to my rock. Exalted be God my Savior. He is the God who avenges me, who subdues nations under me, who saves me from my enemies. You exalted me above my foes. From a violent man you rescued me. Therefore I will praise you, Lord, among the nations. I will sing the praises of your name. You see, David didn't focus on the enemies. David focused on the one who was greater than the enemies. And that's what God wants us to do. When we face this giant of fear, anxiety, allow God to be the focus so that we can truly, truly worship Him. Would you pray with me, please? Dear God, we thank You so much for, for David and for his story. And Father, we thank You for the fact that David showed us that there will be people who scare us. There will be people who annoy us and bother us and bully us. But You are greater than all those people. And while they may annoy us for a while, they can't take away our joy because our joy should come in serving You and living for You. So God, I pray whether it's people, whether it's situations, whether it's health, whether it's finances, or whether it's something else that's causing fear to creep in our lives. Lord, I pray that you will help us to, to battle that fear and that giant by focusing on you. And Lord, I pray that you will help us to live for you to the best of our ability. For we ask it in your name. Amen.